Hello and welcome to Dialogues with Mayank. Following is a conversation with Dr. Namrata Goswami, who is an independent senior analyst, an author, and a Minerva grantee. We talk about a lot of things here. We talk about northeastern states, about Naga's plight, Mizoram. We talk about Indochina, US and China, COVID in China. We also talk about outer space. So we start from northeastern states, go all the way to China, US, and we touch outer space. We have broken down the conversation into three parts. This is where we touch outer space. Yeah, I was saying uh, we'll move to outer space now because I have a story. I just want to know if it was true or not. Yeah. So in 1996, uh, NASA had launched this mission to probe an asteroid called 433 Eros. And when they landed on that asteroid, a man named Greg claimed that it was his. And he sent a $20 parking ticket to NASA because he said that when the asteroid was discovered, no, ma- nobody made a property claim. So I claimed it and it's now my property. And then he sued NASA for $20. So can we claim property like these in outer spaces? Even though he did oh, not one eventually. Oh, I see. Well, that's a great story. I didn't know about it. So thank you for bringing it to my attention. Now I'll have to look into it. But I can answer to your question in general. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of space, the Outer Space Treaty that was signed in 1967, and that was uh, constituted by the US, USSR and the United Kingdom, and then signed by 110 countries today, is that you cannot uh, appropriate uh, property or territory in outer space. So even if you land somewhere first or you, uh, you know, have that particular entitlement, you think you have, you still cannot claim uh, property. You cannot appropriate any property or territory in space or claim national sovereignty. So I think what he probably tried to do, I have to look into the case, is that he uh, basically uh, argued that uh, since I have landed here first, I have the entitlement, but the Outer Space Treaty will not support that particular position as it stands today. We don't know if that will change because treaties can be ratified and change, but at least uh, on May 23rd, 2021, that would be the position internationally. Mm-hmm. His his argument was that the outer space is for the entire mankind, so I can claim it. But yeah, obviously. yes, so, right. So the, then the then the philosophical question will be that if it is for entire mankind or humankind, then how can you claim it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because then if I go there and I want to access to it, then you cannot say both things. You cannot say that this is for entire humankind and then say that I only have right to this particular property. Right. True, true, true. And also, people that's have the been argument. Saying, for example, yeah, yeah, in many ahead. cases, Sorry. that uh, I have a property on Moon. Uh, even after a sad demise of Sushant Singh Rajput, he was a Bollywood actor here. People said that he had land on Moon. So, I've also heard uh, like Shahrukh Khan owns la- land on Moon. And this this was when I was in school. Like I've heard this. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fiction. So. <laughs> okay. It, it could be that they people because they had so much uh, popular you know culture uh, you know reach you can say that you he has land on moon but internationally first of all you have to get there uh, to mm. have land on moon secondly you'll have to sustain yourself so the moon is not very easy it first of all does not have uh, an atmosphere secondly you'll have to have a base or a habitat that offers you a life support system. Second, you have to, you know, uh, be able to uh, guard yourself against radiation because you don't have an atmosphere. The sun's radiation comes in very, uh, without any, uh, you know, atmosphere that saves you. Like the earth has an atmosphere that saves us. So for example, when you see the Northern lights, right? In Norway and Canada, those are because solar flares have come in, but the earth's atmosphere have basically protected you. So you see it as a beautiful green, blue light, but the moon doesn't have that. So so then if mm-hmm. Sh- Shah Rukh Khan has land there, he first of all has to have property there. He has to have a document that tells people that, and who gave it to him because the moon belongs to no one. And who did he pay for that land? First of all, he doesn't have the capability to get there. So, uh, and so the only countries, I mean, India tried to land. Remember 2018, there was this, uh, the soft landing on the moon by Chandrayaan. Right, right. 
mm-hmm. that failed in the last few seconds. So it's very yeah. hard to get to the moon. But it is uh, it is funny to see that there are these stories yeah. uh, that as, as as children we hear so many stories, but it's just fun. So uh, I want to hear your thoughts, and I know this is not a good question to ask a scholar or a PhD holder. But what are your thoughts on uh, the theories that Apollo's are uh, short, okay. like the the Apollo missions were faked, hoax of moon landing, and all of that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So that has been a continuous conspiracy. It's a conspiracy. Conspiracy theories are always there. But mm-hmm. uh, my academic take and my scientific take is that the Apollo landings happen. Uh, you had the flag placed on the moon, and uh, Neil Armstrong was the first man to walk on the moon. So that's my 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 take. Okay. <laughs> But conspiracy theories are always will always be there for everything. So. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, staying on the conspiracy point. So did you see? Uh, the footage that came out uh from the us navy a uh, commander fraver flying a plane and watching an object go from 60000 feet to 1000 feet in a matter of seconds yes like, I, i saw okay. that It, yes i saw that i even i also saw the 60 minutes uh, uh you know telecast on the when they talked to the two pilots that actually saw that happen and that the commander navy... fraver and the co-pilot yeah yes yeah so i saw that and so well that's a very interesting phenomenon right so it's an identified phenomenon or mm-hmm. ufo's as is more popularly known in fact president barack obama gave a uh, exactly uh, yeah, mm-hmm. i was going to come to that yes yes he spoke to cnn where he said that we have to wait and see what is this because first of all if you listen to the and you know both of you know this more than me because i see that you have looked into it is that the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects has been here forever right area 52 you know the controversy around roswell uh, yes Obviously. roswell yes right and so this has been and the blue book the the investigation into it that was run mm-hmm. by the us air force there is a very good series on blue book i think it's on amazon prime that looks into that so um and so my my take is that uh, first of all the as you were mentioning the ability of these unidentified objects to first of all fly and move at such high speeds and then change and maneuver and and mimic some of the pilots as they were mentioning their their planes it's absolutely astounding i mean um no other country seems to have that capability and if they do then they have gone ahead of the us uh, you know air flight maneuvering capability secondly it could be a us uh, itself testing some kind of weapon but that has not been proved as uh, obama was mentioning right in his interview that uh, people are not sh- people were not i mean as- and especially the person who ran the investigation said that uh, they didn't know if this is a uh, us uh, capability or facility being investigated my take would be that this is truly an unidentified uh, you know flying phenomenon and uh, we have to be we have to have more investigation into it which i think is starting now so the pentagon i think is uh, restarting their did, yeah. yes their program in looking into this um the usual and so this is something that i'm glad you asked this question since i follow space and i don't study this particular phenomenon but i am aware of it since it's a part of the discourse There are two ways of looking at this. One is that there is this usual tendency to uh, make fun of it, right? That oh this is not serious, this is not serious academic work. This is not uh, something that uh, you know people are making up these stories. But then the second important point is that you have these videos now which which are not coming out of some private uh, Exactly, actor, yeah. It's but US, from the US media yeah. for personal yeah. gain, you know. Yeah so they they will not they will not do that uh and in fact in that uh, CBS interview they speak to the person I'm forgetting his name who actually was behind de- declassifying right you might mm-hmm. you might be knowing the names so uh, he was the main person who, what was his name Thiraj Commander Fravor Commander Fravor yeah yeah so yes and then the person who was in charge of studying the phenomenon Uh, of ufos i think in the pentagon he basically said that we need to declassify this and so they have declassified the videos and so the second serious academic question is that that this is truly unexplainable phenomenon and uh, what is it 
so if it is not US secret technology, if it is not Russian technology, if it's not Chinese technology, none of those countries have claimed it. It is truly advanced maneuvering capability. So what is it? And so I know as human civilization, we are fearful of the answer, right? So <laughs> exactly. is it truly alien technology? And if it is, it's far more advanced than what we have on Earth. That is truly scary because we don't know the intent if that is the case, right? Exactly. And so, and I saw, and I saw I'm looking, I'm actually looking forward to what kind of uh, investigation comes out of serious uh, studies. Yeah, like you so, said, people enjoy making fun of it. I think undermining is always more fun than appreciating. That is the reason. Yes, and also people, uh, I'm, uh, the tendency usually is that when you don't know something or you're ignorant, instead of saying that, okay, we don't know, we truly don't know, Mm -hmm. uh, we are we are based because of our egos or because of our uh, inability to appreciate someone else's uh, excitement or we tend to dismiss it right yeah. and so my position as an academic is that okay now I mean I know there was skepticism of private people claiming that they were kidnapped by UFOs I'm skeptical <laughs> of that right there are these videos and documentaries but now you have the US Navy coming up with this extraordinary phenomenon, I think it would be a uh, it would be dangerous if we do not study it and try to understand what it is. I think the reason for undermining such phenomena is because it shifts the theological paradigms that our culture holds and that can be detrimental for a lot of people, uh, society. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I, I would not like to get into theology right now, but I'd like to ask what are the implications if it is an uh, alien alien technology? So what are the implications for space as humans? If there is aliens like coming here and for whatever reason, like the, you know, like we don't know the intent, but what are the implications for space? Well, so yeah, we can talk it talk about this in terms of uh, since I don't follow this phenomenon, but I can still uh, hypothetically and speculate about the implications since the phenomenon is there. Okay, let's assume for the sake of the podcast that this is that there is an investigation done and they find out that this is uh, alien technology, right? So mm -hmm. if that is the investigation point. Uh, uh, if some investigation tells us, say, in two years that this is truly not Earth-based technology, but this is unexplained technology, we don't know from where, but this is alien technology, then the implications would be that, that first of all, this is a technology that is able to wrap time, right? It's it's the way it's moving, the way it's wrapping time, it's 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 a very advanced technology. So right. it, it, it would only mean that then there is an alien civilization be it in our inner solar system or beyond, that is able to do that, which uh, scientists have talked about, including uh, some of the wonderful fiction we saw, right? For example, you know, uh, Battle, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, mm -hmm. and everything else that we saw. Cool in our, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so it means that there is actually that technology. Second, it would mean that we are not alone in this universe. That itself is such a philosophically... Uh, important point because till now we think because we have not been able to go beyond earth and universe is so vast right yes, the yes. universe the whole universe is moving you know even the whole inner solar system is moving so then it would mean that we are truly not alone and we the humanity search since our ancestors started looking at the skies is that there is something out there and we are not the only habitable planet. Now you know that uh, NASA has discovered all these exoplanets, which seems to be very similar mm -hmm. to Earth, oh, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the uh, Goldilocks ones. That's right. And so the, the second point is that it means that we are not alone. And what does that mean? Now, the third implication would be that, okay, if we are not alone, if Earth is not only the only habitable planet, now the search would be that is this alien, whoever has come or whoever has uh, showcased this technology, what is their intent? Is their intent peaceful or is their intent uh, dangerous, right? So we don't know. The usual tendency is to think that aliens will be conflictual with, with human beings, but we don't know. Mm. We, haven't, we haven't had that phenomenon happen. So those are, I think, the three most fundamental implications at the philosophical and scientific level 
that uh, if this is in some future investigative study, this is proven to be a truly not Earth-based technology that the Navy pilots documented, that means that we are not alone. And every single, this project SETI is trying every time to see if we can listen to the universe. The China's Chang'e 4, uh, the probe that they send to the far side of the moon, uh, which is the side we never see, is that mm -hmm. they have a radio telescope that is listening to the solar system. Because the thing is that if you're having telescopes or listening devices on Earth, they get manipulated by all the Earth waves and sounds, right? So it's not a quiet way to do it. But if you send it to the far side of the moon, which where our human conversations, waves and microwaves do not disturb, it's a very quiet part of the universe. So have they heard anything? They haven't released any data. So we don't know. But the day we conclude that this is actually something not Earth-based is going to be an absolutely uh, unique phenomenon for us. I don't know how we'll behave. Will we feel fearful? Will we feel hopeful? It'll all depend. Of, yes, right. I think a lot of emotions at once. Yes, a lot of emotions. We'll feel excited that we are not the only ones. We will. Human beings always want to know. So we'll want to know who this, uh, where it came from. And so, have you heard of the phenomenon of Oumuamua that has recently happened, where there is yeah, this, yeah, right? Yeah, it's like a football field, and it uh, it took uh, like the course of its of its movement did not did not uh, it took a swing from the gravitational pull to sling itself off to sustain energy or something. Yeah, because they are not able to explain what it. Uh, basically constitutes right so it could be a natural phenomenon and some people argue that passing through the solar system uh it could be something that is a truly interstellar probe so um nasa of course has been trying to study it uh the Oumuamua phenomenon that is traveling through interstellar space and what is very fascinating is that if you look at the nasa page on Oumuamua, it's mm -hmm. a probe or a natural phenomenon we don't know uh, that okay. has been traveling uh, from interstellar space to our solar system for millions of years so it's oh. a un truly unique phenomenon okay. also the like crop circles and all of that the patterns that we see yes there were these particular uh, documentaries that <laughs> certain phenomenon that was uh, inexplicable, inex right? right? So, yeah, so as an academic scientist, my usual uh, position is that, okay, there is this particular claim that has mm -hmm. been made. It could be authentic, it could be inauthentic, but I think it's always useful to study it to the point that you can then prove that it's authentic or it's not authentic, right? right, right. And so you have, to, you have to always keep an open mind. True, true. Also, I think if there is an alien life and it's so advanced, I think they don't care who we are and what we do. I think there is any point. <laughs> well, no, the it... fact that if if they, yeah, I mean, ahead. if you if you think about it, yeah, go ahead. So uh, I think we how we study apes, they would like to study us at least. Uh, that argument that they don't care about resources as they have the the whole universe to themselves. But that's after we assume that they come from outside our solar systems. But if they are inhabitants inside our solar systems and they don't have the, the they, they, they can only travel to Earth, so then that implication that, that, that their intent can be wrong. But mm -hmm. I think you know, it can be for study purposes, but I don't think they need resources if they can come here from light tra by traveling light years. I don't think they need resources. What are you saying, Dr. Namrata? Yeah, no, I mean, it's both. I, I, it's interesting you have uh, different perspectives here, which is great. So, yeah, I mean, in a sense that if, if at all they have been able to demonstrate the capabilities that are suspected in terms of the Navy videos, they, they have to be a truly developed uh, technological civilization, right? Mm -hmm. And so are they coming here for resources? Are they coming to study uh, Earth? Are they also in lookout of the fact as we are, as to whether we are the only living habitable planet in a universe that is completely silent, 
which is a very scary fe- feeling, right? That Earth okay. is the only habitable planet. And so that is why I think some of the uh, unique conversations that I study in terms of space in the US is that if you listen to uh, Elon Musk, for example, who started SpaceX in 2002, uh, or Blue or, or Jeff Bezos, Amazon, the founder of Amazon and then Blue Origin, which is the space startup, the first two companies to demonstrate reusability, both of them actually are inspired by the ideology that if Earth gets inhabitable, for example, because of the rise of climate issues and mm-hmm. the fear that we have, the of it is very critical that. That's right, and so the argument is that if we are to succeed as a civilization and continue and yeah, have our kids yeah. and mm-hmm. grandkids continue, we need to have another habitable planet, right? right? And so they are looking to, of course, terraform Mars, a uh, uniquely. Mars. And, and also change Mars or establish something in the, for example, the O'Neillian colonies, right? Jared O'Neill's argument that if humanity is to survive, it needs to develop this uh, habitable orbit, uh, orbit, like habitable systems in orbit, which will be able to get mm-hmm. resources from the moon and elsewhere, and human beings will survive there. So there is this very serious conversation here in the private sector, at least, that they are thinking about doing this and and are investing uh, capability. For example, if you listen to Musk's TED Talks and his uh, ideological position, he -hmm. points out that the very reason he's investing in SpaceX and building these reusable platforms, which brings down the cost of launch, right? So, which means that like airplanes, which were very expensive when they first started because planes were not manufactured in a wide scale, uh, people only who had money could afford it. But now this this is the case with space. So now we all can afford an mm-hmm. airplane ticket. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, the prices has come down. The more slot uh, of economics. Yes, more slot, right? And so yeah. at least I, I come from a very middle class family in India. And in India, for many years, my parents only travel by train or by, you know, car. It was only later that they started and very rarely started using planes, right? Because you have to do the cost benefit analysis of a single, of a father, only, only sole earner with kids that have education. So you have to do so many different calculations at that right. time. Mm-hmm. So today, if space gets reusable, which means that the cost of launch comes down, like airplanes in the 19, you know, after the Wright brothers flew, uh, it'll open up. And so Musk's argument is that I'm investing in reusable capabilities so that we can have this possibility of being able to have another place to go to in case Earth becomes inhabitable. And he said, I'm not going to live to see that phenomenon, but at least I will set up an infrastructure system that people coming after me will benefit from, right? And so it's a very interesting discourse in the US. Mm-hmm. So before we move, Dr. Goswami, I just one question. I know you are tied in schedule. So should we move or should we pause here and then maybe meet some other time? I mean, if you want to, how long do you want to continue in terms of the conversation? We we, we don't mind. We can do one thing that we'll, we'll stop now or we'll make it into parts. So we can release it into parts, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. Or if you have some other day, if you have time, then because I think it'll be very fun talking to you again and again. Yeah, exactly. Please come back. Like this is one of the even most if we wrap up, yeah, I, I like to come. I we like like you to come. come. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. So let's wrap up today because I have a lunch. Uh, you know, I can shift it, but then I have to call and shift it. Right? No, no, no that's fine. No, no, no. So, Please don't do that. Yeah. So let's let's meet again, and uh, next time let's talk a bit more about space and space yeah, exactly. policy. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very sorry. I diverted the topic from space oh, no to conspiracy theories but <laughs> no but i think that's because it's in the news today and it's inevitable that we'll talk about it yes right. okay, okay so sure. thank you for thanks a lot for coming and we are really honored because you're here i read a lot about you i googled a lot about you but we'll meet again for sure and we'll for sure discuss outer space and only outer space that'll be more fun i think Yes, and and so much to talk about in outer space. Well, yes. thank you. And I did not hear much about you and what you do. So next time, probably you should introduce yes, yourself sure. and, and tell me a bit. I, the only thing I know is that you were not born in 1991. <laughs> <laughs> yes. well, so anyway, nice talking to you. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you so you. much for coming. It was bye very bye. fun. Okay, bye-bye. Okay,